The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and thanks for joining today's webinar on Data Security Essentials, um, otherwise known as How Not to Hit the Started. Um, so just to give you an overview, we are designed, the webinar is designed to provide and implement data security technologies to deal with um, advanced threats. Um, I'll start by giving a very brief bites intro. Um, I will be brief and apologies if I sound a little bit unclear today. I have a slight head cold, so hopefully you can all hear me nice and clearly. Um, I'll briefly chat about why we have chosen to do this topic today, why data security is increasing in importance. Um, introduce Neil Thacker from WebSense and then Neil will be covering the majority of the content of the webinar, looking at um, data security, how to take data security strategy to execution, um, some insights that he has in terms of what um, CISOs and information security officers are saying about DLP, and then look at insider threats versus outsider threats before our interactive Q&A. So, um, just a little bit of housekeeping to start. Um, lines for attendees will be on mute throughout the webinar. However, questions are more than welcome. Please um, do post those via the, the chat box and we will do a full question and answer at the end. Um, we, during today's um, session, we won't be discussing any commercials in terms of any of the technologies, though of course we're more than happy to discuss those um, further to the webinar and um, with account managers. However, we'll be keeping the webinar to strategic um, and technical discussions today. We do have a survey at the end. Uh, please do take the time to fill it in. It makes sure that we can make these sessions more and more valuable for yourselves. And lastly, we will make a recording of the webinar available to all attendees post-event. It will also be posted on our website so you can review this at your leisure and share that with your teams internally. So a little bit about Bytes. Um, we are part of the 2.3 billion Altron Electronics Group who are listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and as a global business, Bytes Technology Group um, are um, encompassing in South Africa and the UK across a global £700 million business. Um, within the UK, a £165 million business with two main focuses. Um, firstly, we have Bytes Software Services, who are the largest Microsoft um, value-added reseller in the UK. Um, they specialise in software licensing, Microsoft, Adobe, um, Oracle, and various different enterprise agreements on software licensing. Um, then we have Bytes Security Partnerships, which is the part of the business that, that I work within, and we are a network security specialist reseller. So we focus solely on network security, and we're required by Bytes in 2011 to bring that specialist security focus to the business. The difference, difference being that we operate across hardware and software, providing full security support and implementation, as well as the software licensing specialism. specialism. Um, a little bit about Bytes Security Partnerships. Um, we, as I've mentioned, IT security specialists since 1999, with um, 16 years now focused on network security. Um, in that time, we've seen continuous yearly growth of 20% plus um, by continuing to do what we do best, which is so focused on security. As part of that, we're really passionate about um, educating customers, educating um, businesses there about what they, um, have, what they can be doing to future their security infrastructure. Um, we offer support and consultancy and one of the things we're really proud of is that we offer direct to engineer support um, to escalation so there's no first line support logging calls and tickets, instead we're resolving customers' security issues in-house and working with vendors to make sure that their security, that their security technologies can be implemented in the best way possible. Um, so as part of our security education remit, that's really why we run webinars such as today. So I'll give you a very brief overview of what's occurring, why are we speaking to you about day theft and data security strategy. Um, what we found is more and more customers are coming to us with some of the, the following dilemmas or questions around their, their data security. You know, how can they avoid revenue and reputation damage from insider leakage? How can they comply with industry regulations and standards, making sure that they are you know, avoiding some penalties and problems when it comes to keeping their um, requirements as regards industry regulations? Um, 
increasingly people are talking to us about how can we detect, respond and recover from targeted attacks and that's all becoming more and more challenging um, during rapid adoption of cloud technologies, mobile technologies and sort of end user computing moving into the business space. Um, for that reason, you know, technology really is a means and not the end to data loss. So that's why we are talking to you today around okay, te the, the best technologies in the world. You know, what, what do you do with them? How can you implement them? And how can you make sure that they are driving the value that you don't want them to be? Um, why have we chosen to talk to you about this topic with WebSense? Well, WebSense have got years of experience in resolving data security challenges, so they're really in a great place to um, share what some of those challenges are and how those can be resolved. Um, our speaker today, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Neil, um, you know, both personally at WebSense from, from years of speaking with, with CISOs around the UK in his role and also at the base when um, in working 10 years experience in information security and end user organisation. He really does um, know his stuff in terms of best and also worst practice of um, implementing data security technologies. And um, lastly, it's really the right time. It must be said that data regulations are tightening. Um, we ran a webinar last year talking about some new upcoming EU data regulations. The penalties are rising for non-compliance with um, data protection regulations. So the, the need is, is increasing in terms of making sure that you're adopting technologies in the right fashion. So all that really it remains for me today is to introduce our guest speaker today who will um, take you through a lot of his experience in terms of this um, space. Um, Neil has 15 years experience in information security, 10 of which was gleaned in end user um, information security roles in financial services, so brings a lot of experience of end user issues to the table. Um, he's an active member of the ENISA Threat Landscape Stakeholder Group and he also works um, along with the EU agency programme to position the threat landscape offer mitigation advice and give some innovation and insight um, in terms of what threats are happening out there and how they can best be combated. Lastly, um, in his role with WebSense, he regularly holds meetings with CISOs of global organisations who are planning their data security strategies, so it's in a great place to share um, his insight from those meetings. So I'm just going to hand over to Neil now. Um, Neil will be walking you through the data security landscape and how we can um, implement data security technologies. Very briefly, it will go to the holding screen and then hopefully you will be able to hear and see new slides. Many thanks. Okay, uh, thanks Shona. Um, hello and welcome to everybody joining today's webinar. Um, it's my pleasure to be, uh, to be presenting to you today. So yeah, my name is Neil Thacker. A very kind introduction there from Shona. She stole all my best lines. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about data security essentials and how to own your data before your adversary. Um, so starting off, um, I'm a member of WebSense's Office of the CSO team. So this is a, we have six uh, InfoSec uh, leaders or that we've been defined as leaders in the community. We're, we're there pretty much as a resource that can be used by anybody at any time, not just WebSense customers. We offer advice around strategy um, alongside technology. So um, again, as a great takeaway before we've even started the, uh, the, the presentation today. If you have any questions uh, around information security in general, always feel free to reach out to us. You can, you can access uh, our page at websense.com slash CSO. Um, as Shona also mentioned, I'm a member of ENISA, the European Union Agency for Network and Information Security. So I've been involved in, uh, with ENISA for the last year and a half around understanding threat landscape and also um, contributing to their reports around threat landscape. So you can, there was a recent report that was released about three weeks ago that highlights the latest trends and I'll be covering some of that today as well. Also in my spare time, I'm co-founder of the Security Advisor Alliance. So this is a non-profit organization for CISOs and security managers to uh, collaborate and share advice and in, in most cases share some good concepts, new ways of thinking around security as well. We have a podcast, so if you're ever bored, you have an hour or two to spare, feel free to subscribe to the Security Advisor Alliance podcast. So getting into the, uh, the, the detail around this presentation, I wanted to really go through 
what I'm seeing at the moment in the infosec industry around what are the big concerns. Primarily, it's all around data theft. It seems to be the, the top issue, even coming down from the CEO now, is that there's a concern, there's some issues around how we need to protect our organization, how we protect the data, and how we mitigate the likelihood of data theft. So WebSense sponsored a, a survey last year by the Pondman Institute. You can download and, and have access to, the, to the, the material using this link. But we, I wanted to highlight some kind of key takeaways. So it started off, it was, just, it was a survey of less than just under 5,000 InfoSec practitioners across 15 countries, and we requested an average of 10 years' experience. These are the responses. So we had 57% respondents do not think their organization is protected from advanced cyber attacks. 63% doubted they could stop the exfiltration of confidential information. 80% said their company's leaders do not equate losing confidential data with a potential loss of revenue. And then finally, 35% of those who had sensitive or confidential data stolen didn't know exactly what data had been stolen. So those are current, these, these are current sort of worrying statistics. Because what we see is that these numbers are slightly too high. And in most cases, organizations are saying they can't actually protect their data. In most cases, from a threat perspective, somebody can come in they can actually perform their reconnaissance, gain access to the company's critical assets and their data, and then walk out the door with them, and in most cases, they cannot respond, and they cannot react to that. So perhaps the most worrying thing here is that the 35% who had data stolen had no idea what had been stolen. In most cases, it's down to a third party to identify exactly what data had been stolen from organizations, which is a big issue because, as Shona mentioned right at the beginning, laws are changing. Again, there's, there's more focus on compliance around really understanding and identifying and protecting your data, um, regardless of data sets. So I'll be covering some of the kind of the key wins, the key takeaways really to focus on how you can do that, some strategy um, alongside some technology as well. Um, so hopefully um, all this will, will add value to you. So looking at breach causality, so really looking at where typically breaches occur. So we also, um, we also ran a survey last year looking at where most security professionals have a, have a concern around, again, the, the target in, or the source of these types of attacks. And number one, um, by, again, a significant margin was negligent insiders. So typically employees working in organizations that already have access to data, and in most cases are they, are they leaking this data um, intentionally, um, either through some misuse of technologies, but also, again, in some cases maliciously as well. We had an issue with lost or stolen devices, working with insecure third parties where data would typically traverse networks, and then even things like the use of internet and just general social media. So those kind of, in, in that top four, this is kind of where we start looking at where typically laws are going to be focusing on and trying to highlight negligence in organizations. Where are people being negligent, negligent around protecting data? Then we start looking at things like web-based attacks, where it's typically an external attack, um, this can include things like phishing, waterhole attacks, targeted attacks using kind of multiple stages to gain access to the data. Then, again, there was a big concern around the mobile workforce, how much data is on mobile devices, um, through email, again, through applications that we typically manage, and then things like viruses and malware, and in most cases, things like remote, remote access trojans that actually profile and steal data. The, the, that's, their, that's their pro purpose. So really it's looking at kind of how and ways that we can actually look at the breaches and where they, where they actually uh, arise from. We also spoke to, again, CEOs looking at what they're trying to do as part of their, their security program, as part of their, their overall um, corporate strategy. And number one was reducing the data breach cost. So not necessarily reducing the data breach and ensuring that data breaches just don't happen, but reducing the cost applied to trying to mitigate and respond to a data breach. And then again, second was around reducing the legal defense costs. So when organizations are compromised, um, that there's a very quick turnaround time to identify what data had been stolen. So they can actually then again communicate to their customers, in some cases to their own employees, exactly what's happened and again the risk involved as part of that. So those are kind of really important things to start talking about, even currently to your, to your board, to your exec team, trying to understand exactly what they're trying to do um, as part of the security program and the investment in security in the organization. 
So, talking about threats, so we know about that the, the, you're more likely to be suffered a, a, a data breach from an insider, but also we also have those external, those, those um, in most cases, malicious external threats that are targeting your organization. And you may have heard of me talk about this before, this is a very common way of identifying how threats typically work, either, again, ing ingressly into your network or looking at stealing data from the exportation stage and also in some cases how they move laterally. So this is the, um, this is referred to as WebSense's seven stage kill chain and I'll be walking through some examples of how even we're seeing external threats targeting and stealing data. And to start off with we have a really basic way of how these things operate and it's known as um, executing things like fake AV. So friends, family, um, typically I'm, I've, I've had issues, um, personal issues with friends and family being targeted and being a victim of things like fake AV. And it starts off with that typical lure stage. Somebody has sent an email with a link, they click on the link and all of a sudden they get a pop-up saying, congratulations, you've been offered some antivirus anti pro technology, try now buy later. They unfortunately click on that link and a piece of malware downloads. Um, they obviously have great marketing teams at these organizations because uh, they're really selling uh, their malware in most cases. Keep your PC, your info and your sanity safe. Um, those kind of things again are, are, are pretty good marketing messages. People will, will be interested in again, finding out more about this. Um, again, the malware comes down as part of a dropper file. Um, typically we'll just install either through email or through a web uh, driven payload and this is kind of what it looks like. It runs and um, actually in some cases offers some type of uh, security but un the underlying role in the, the code is really to steal things like financial data. So that's the most basic common uh, things that we're seeing out there at the moment. Now these things in quantity are significant. There's lots of this fake AV out there, uh, ransomware, very similar or executed in a very similar way and in most cases it will have a basic antivirus detection by using specific payloads that are, that are encrypted, um, that execute and again in, in most cases that they're, they're, they're not going to be detected by AV. When we start looking at slightly more sophisticated attacks, things like waterhole attacks, we still may see a lure being used to target an employee in an organization. Um, this is an example of mapsoftheworld.com which is again a legitimate website that had been compromised. It sits in the, the Alexa ranking websites, it's a top 1000 website out there and this is kind of what it looks like. This site was compromised. What happened is when you visited this website you were redirected via iframe um, through to a dynamic DNS website that actually then had uh, an exploit kit laying in wait. The exploit kit was the Fiesta exploit kit, um, a very cheap to purchase exploit kit that can be used to target employees at organizations that have vulnerabilities um, typically on their endpoint. We're also seeing exploit kits targeting mobile devices and not just traditional laptops and, and desktops, um, in some cases obviously targeting servers as well. The dropper file in this instance that was various, um, there wasn't one unique piece of malware, it was all launching multiple dropper files to evade detection and again could, could bypass AV detection. It used the very well known Zeus um, command and control infrastructure to initiate a call home and again the, the, the focus and the, the action taken from this whole um, threat life cycle was to steal PII, so personal identifiable information, and also financial data as well. Then we start talking about the perhaps the most sophisticated types of attacks. We initially we had again the fake AV, we had again a a, um, a waterhole style attack using maps of the world, and then we see obviously very targeted attacks, almost considered espionage or APT, focusing on again um, looking at specific organizations. In this organization it was targeting a, um, a French aerospace organization and they what they did, the attacker was set up a, a website and used a um, again a domain that was very very similar to the aerospace organization um, and they what we call is a typo squat um, they registered a domain any, any employees that went to that website um, typically there was another redirect using my frame this is what it looks like there was an exploit kit that used a zero day uh, vulnerability in Shockwave, um, then Dropper dropped the malware down and was loaded into memory, so again completely evading AV detection. They used in this circumstance the command and control infrastructure using ZX Shell, and again their focus was stealing IP, intellectual property, with a real focus on espionage, stealing those trade secrets. 
So those are kind of three examples where we're seeing external threats coming into organizations, and they typically follow a similar pattern. As you can see, they all follow, in most cases, they trigger an event in that, in that kill chain life cycle. So one thing is important, a good takeaway straight away is understanding how the kill chain works, understanding how you can detect events that occur as part of a target attack where they're looking to steal data. We see, again, recon is being very easy to do nowadays. Um, there's websites such as Shodan that can actually, you can type in and query our devices that are connected to the internet that may exist in your data centers that are part of your infrastructure. These are free tools. This is not anything that's available on the, on the dark net. These are free tools available to anybody. You can actually go and look for devices that are connected to your network out there at the moment. Looking at people and performing reconnaissance on people is, again, very easy to do nowadays using tools like PQ, typing people's names and addresses, or in some cases, just usernames, and then do, doing, running a search um, and give back lots and lots of results around specific, again, um, identities very, very easy. But they can then some ingress and egress points into your network where you have any type of attack, the more information they can get at this stage, your organization and then stealing that data. So how do we need to really approach this? So we know that common technologies exist. We know that there's been, a, again, a big focus over the last 15 years on really protecting our infrastructure. But obviously with the move away from data centers and storing all of your data within a data center, these kind of things no longer really work. And also, they're not really considered mature. Uh, a file, even an next-gen file and a UTM are great at protecting infrastructure, but not so great at protecting data. Over time, we've kind of moved into this space where we've used tools such as SIMs, and antivirus, and obviously device encryption to protect our employees from losing devices, and in some cases, again, being targeted by, by known malware. But again, these things are good for compliance, but again, they're not really going to protect your data um, going forward. Some organizations uh, in the last few years really focused on understanding the threats and how the threats operate. And looking at tools such as breach, breach detection, in some cases, even having somebody in their team that's trained on malware forensics, and also having feeds into their organizations to look at threat intelligence across the globe, looking at indicators, looking at campaigns, looking at how these can map to understanding the threats so that you can put in a good countermeasure. Some organizations are also looking at threat modeling, and it's actually a service that WebSense offer. We offer pro bono threat modeling to understand, again, your organization and all so how you can deploy the best countermeasure based on your, your assets that you have to protect and also the current countermeasures you have as well. I'll be covering some of that a bit later on. And then finally, we have, again, where most organizations are trying to get to, very few, um, with the exception of a handful of financial services organizations, are into the full risk data-centric strategy where they've deployed full DLP, they've, they run regular data discovery, they're focused on data encryption, um, in some cases, anonymization of, of data, masking of data, and they're also using things like behavioral analy analytics and predictive analytics to prevent data breaches. And again, this is where most organizations are trying to move to. Um, most CISOs that I meet, this is kind of their, uh, their, their, almost their end goal in the next few years to move to this type of strategy. Because in most cases, you can relate this purely to things like business risk. So from a communications perspective, it's great to go into the boardroom and start talking about the impact to your organization by looking at specific types of, again, business risk. Always good to understand the likelihood and the impact. And this is what business risk gives you. Threat gives you typically likelihood. Some baseline and perimeter type um, security really focuses on um, small portions of those both. But again, this is where I'm seeing most CISO security managers really trying to move towards that business risk, understanding that at that stage four. And using more, again, predictive technologies, so predicting events before they happen, uh, this is available with most technologies out there today, less so the infrastructure and compliance type tools that are passive monitoring type tools, more tools that are predictive, having the ability to stop an attack before that action, before the data theft occurs. That's kind of the end goal and the, 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 the common strategy most CISOs are focusing on. So to put this into some perspective, kind of how do we move forward? How do we build a strategy around this? How do we move towards risk-based risk data-centric? And to do that, we really need to understand how, again, the assets that we need to protect in the organization, how this relates to the risks, the vulnerabilities that we are exposed to, and the countermeasures that we've deployed. Because obviously what we have is we have threats and threat agents out there that are targeting and looking to exploit those vulnerabilities, which leads to risks, which leads to those assets. 
So again, something that really needs to be focused on is that from a, from a security perspective, it shouldn't be down just to the security team to focus solely on what assets they need to protect and also how they protect them. It should be some, uh, there should be a relationship, there should be a coalition that's built that focuses on the owners, the business owners, the risk owners and the data owners that really value those assets. The first question I always ask or, or recommend anybody asking if they're new to their role is who are the business owners, risk owners and data owners and also what is it I'm here to protect? What are the crown jewels of the organization? What is it what will give the biggest impact to the organization if we suffer a data breach? What is that most critical data? And explaining this and looking at this blueprint of security will always help you um, in order to do that. And again, build relationships and again, build a team bigger than the information security team that you have bring those owners into, again, your role, meet with them as frequently as you can, um, because that will give you further insight into the, into the assets you need to protect. This is a typical CISO role. This is a, um, I've customized this to cover my role. Um, but again, the fundamentals come down to kind of a few key areas. So obviously managing things like security operations, managing your technologies, in some cases using that te those technologies and those metrics to educate your employees. But also really focusing on things like risk management and that data centric strategy. So looking at things like data discovery, data classification, access control, data leakage prevention, again looking at partner access and third party access, and then in, some, in most cases the mitigations that you can then apply that again can protect that data, the encryption, masking, anonymization, and then for everything else, monitoring and alerting. And the, the majority of the next 30 minutes is going to be covering that focus on that data centric strategy and how you can look at data discovery, classification, access control as part of your program. And if anybody was, would like a, a copy of this, um, please feel free to let me know. I can send you the in the raw format um, in XMind and you can build your own. It's entirely up to you if you're interested. So looking at things like security operations, how security operations also need to focus on this. We start looking at how they need to get better at identifying and then protecting their assets. And then for everything else, as I mentioned, for the monitoring and alerting, how they get better at detecting, responding, and recovering. Now again, working in security operations, I've worked in understand what you're trying to protect. So what I tell our security operations team at WebSense is that we really need to, if we see an event, if we detect something, we need to look back at our protective countermeasures um, as part of that and see if there was an issue. We also need to try and attribute and try and identify the source of the attack. Was it inside or was it external? And then looking at how we respond and recover becomes a lot easier once we're able to do that. So focusing just on detect, respond, recover um, on its own isn't good enough. We need to do the identify and protect. And that sh should be your, your strategic goal. That should be 80% of your, your role should be focusing on identifying and protecting. And then everything else will become easier because 20% you spend on tactical will help you again detect, respond, recover as well and give you some context into those events that occur. Again, this is how typically you can do that with identify and protect is moving away from things like, like just trying to look at keywords and phrases and dictionaries within things like DLP, but move up the stack and start looking at how you're using things like machine learning and behavioral analytics and also file fingerprinting. Perhaps the most under, underused uh, technology within things like DLP and enterprise DLP is the ability to identify and protect data using things like fingerprinting. So they help you really focus on your policies, the policies you're creating help you classify data without the need to actually classify that data, to stick a confidential flag on that. And again, the accuracy will drive down the operational time spent. So again, the de detect, respond, recover, spending a lot of time on that. Um, again, it's, I rarely see security operations team having spare time and if, because they're constantly focused on detect, respond, recover by fingerprinting, understanding the most critical assets, Tying that to events, they can actually focus on the things that actually will impact the, the organization, in some cases the most significantly above everything else. So this is kind of, again, a standard pyramid that we use to explain how we can't just rely on things like keywords, we have to use other technology, we have to use technology to aid us in this, in this, in this role. It's also understanding, again, the role of um, the actors as well, so not just looking at external and internal actors, it's breaking it down into, again, what types of groups do we see? Do we have a concern that we are being targeted by activist group? We know activist groups will look to steal data. Um, they're not just there to cause availability issues. They want to damage the integrity of the business. And if they can steal data and expose that data, 
um, then again they typically win. And we've seen this in again some high profile attacks. Again, everybody talks about Sony, but see Sony and disclosing mail conversations that happened. Um, as part of that company, a few, quite a few people, senior people, lost their jobs because of that. And things like that, again, are in most cases the activist's role is to damage and disrupt the organisation. But then again, looking at, again former employees, looking at again organised primary, again terrorist groups that may be targeting your organisation, understanding them and putting them into the kind of label, trying to identify the event that's occurring and what type of group it sits with, will always help with your. communication up. So things like um, who thought an auditor was a threat to your organization. Um, in my experience of 15 years, what I've seen in some cases auditors come into organizations, plug their laptop in, look to copy lots of data off to use as evidence, and they're actually breaking in most cases things like the Data Protection Act. Again, in some cases they're going to damage your, your reputation, your, your integrity, if that data is leaked then from their, from their, from their laptop, from their machines, from their networks. So it's understanding, again, what's being plugged into your network, what data is leaving your network from insiders as well. Call centers, again, handle very sensitive information. Typical end users, execs, again, we saw the case last, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, with Hillary Clinton, for instance, using, um, using Gmail, uh, sorry, a personal email account to manage, her, to, to manage her affairs. She didn't have a, again, a corporate, a issued email account. She used a personal email account to conduct state activities and these kind of things again are a big concern. We know execs have access to the data. They're already a privileged user. They already have access to the most sensitive data. We need to understand when an event occurs, was it related to bad process or broken process or a lack of education around how they handle that data. So again, mapping these things out to the actor context um, again is a really, really, really good win straight away. And also this is an example from Veris. Uh, there's lots more examples out there, but this is something I use on a regular basis to communicate the types of actors that we see. This is kind of how the insider threat works, and again, this is a very complicated diagram, but it's a, it's a gr great way of actually visualizing how these things work, and in most cases, it's really looking at behaviors inside of an organization. Now, typically, what you've not been able to do as part of your strategy is monitor all, be all employee behavior um, because you infringe on privacy, etc. but actually tying this to data Again, this is, a, this is an important point. It's tying this to data, um, looking at data behavior, looking at how this employee handles data, you can actually start looking at how they're at, perhaps in some cases acting inappropriately. And again, that's how you justify the, the monitoring that's involved as part of this, around the data, not around the employee behavior. Again, this is available from, um, this is a great diagram from CERT Carnegie Mellon University, how they are, look at the insider threat, how they trigger certain kind of indicators that they can actually then investigate and, and look further into more detail around what's going on inside your organization. And this is kind of how it looks. These are, now, this is, this is from, a, um, from a technology perspective looking at WebSense. I'll be covering more of this later. But this is how I'm seeing, again, things like DLP technology that are used primarily to, again, detect, respond, and prevent, in most cases, data theft. And this is where we're seeing before it used to be based on very simple, again, fingerprint, uh, in some cases, pattern matching. But now it's looking at more behavior. It's looking at things like data risk indicators. Um, it's looking at indicators of compromise and suspicious activity. And then actually labeling this and giving this to the first responder um, as a means of a description, explaining to them uh, what they need to do next, um, why they're all triggered, giving them everything on that one page. This is how DLP has changed. Again, focusing on more the behavioral analytics as well. I'll be covering some of this a bit more later on how the, how the value that DLP will bring you. We can also see, again, the types of data and focusing on certain types of compliance and IP requirements. So again, hundreds of thousands of pounds, or, or now it's pretty, pretty straightforward with basic wizards data that needs to be protected, less so on you telling it what you need to do. And again, this is how I'm seeing, in most cases, organizations really focusing on the technology to produce metrics that can then be used to educate people. I think something that's talked about in information security circles is that there needs to be a focus more on the people and the process, and then apply the technology. But technology will give you the metrics in order to educate. So this is actually, this can go full circle. This can be repeated three or four times. You actually build a very good mature security strategy by looking at these four, four areas closely helping people define your process, helping the process define the technology and the countermeasure that you deploy, 
and then producing the metrics that can be then used to re-educate and train the people as well. So these kind of things, again, raising the human IQ, this is something that we've been focusing on the last few years to really improve and make sure the metrics are actionable. You can actually look at the metrics, understand what they mean, and even in some cases share them directly with your employees. Something that I mentioned right at the beginning is the move towards, again, involving the owners. And this is a common model or strategy. I think it's the last piece of the strategy deck that I cover around how you can help build that coalition. And this is, again, this is a standard um, uh, eight steps to introduce change to any organization. Um, it's the Cotter model. If anybody wants to go around and perform some further research, it can be used in most examples. In, in, in most cases, it's understood as business strategy. So this is a great way to go in and speak to your, to your owners, to, in some cases your board, to explain what you're trying to do as part of your role and also how you're trying to improve the security posture of the organization. So again, there's eight steps, highlight the urgency, I won't cover that, we already know there's an urgency regarding some of the stats that we've seen and the data breaches that we see in the impact. The next stage is to build a coalition and the coalition should be formed primarily by the owners, the information and risk and business owners and they should also be involved at the very early stages to highlight the urgency and help define the vision for the program. And at this stage, again this is the best stage, you can start assigning responsibility before you've even deployed a technology. Skipping through a few, going from vision and communication is around empowerment. And one of the biggest issues I see is that in security operations team, they're trying to manage everything, they're trying to respond to everything, they're trying to understand again what is good and what is bad and what is a, what is a good or bad business process. So by already building that coalition and then empowering that coalition, you can start again delegating the accountability. So not just responsibility, but accountability. You can also identify and fix broken business processes that all organizations will have. One of the biggest moves I've seen within deploying a DLP technology, in, in, in my experience, is you find bro broken business processes from day one. That, again, will, in most cases, land your company in, in trouble because of the current legislation and, again, proposed legislation as well. And really, again, again a bit cliche, but work with the business, not for the business. Um, this, this empowerment will allow you, allow you to do that. And then look at things like absorption as well embed the strategy into the fabric of the organization and using things like perseverance to really ensure that it's absorbed and that people understand your whole process of why you're building things like data security and, and DLP technologies. And again, move to that all-important risk-based data-centric strategy. There is really, I can see, foresee in the next five to ten years, uh, the next strategy to move towards. Once you focus on the risk-based data-centric, you are already winning as part of that. So the kind of the underlying kind of focus is around again getting better at understanding the assets you need to protect, the ownership, the business context. Take this back to again understanding the attackers, the insider threats, the external threats, the vectors, and in most cases the, the, the patterns and the indicators through the kill chain of how they're going to get to that data, and in some cases how they're going to exfiltrate that data. And then look at again how you can get better at pre-incident, using things like sp specific patterns, doing very quick triage, and then taking an action based on a series of events. And that will help you get to that point where you're using things like machine learning, using um, elements of threat, threat intelligence for its intended pur purpose to stop a data breach. And <clears throat> again, looking at things like predictive analytics and talking to your exec team that you're using predictive analytics within your strategy, your security strategy. So building up again from a security strategy, soft skills, technical controls, moving toward prevention and then getting great at detection and response. This pyramid kind of highlights where you should be moving upwards and then looking at, again, feeding back your strategy by coming down again by looking at detection response, prevention, the type of technical controls you have, if they're mature enough, if you need to review your requirements, and then again, again, giving your staff and skills further training so they can understand and then embed that back into the strategy as well. So, questions to ask. I've, I produce a lot of, uh, again, my maps around data, as you, as you can probably tell already. Um, I try to understand again what are the our organizations doing today with data. So on the left here, on this, uh, on this slide before I go through the uh, steps, on the left you have all the things that probably go on as part of a data processing, data in some cases data controlling um, in an organization. And on the right we have all the things that within the security team we should be looking at. Again looking at how we're managing data discovery, data cleansing, data classification, data encryption. Um, and this is a great, this is a great takeaway is again going to speak to your your business intelligence teams understand what they're doing around data 
and again how you can help as part of that, how this all should be around the data itself. It's understanding again the types of data, is it structured or unstructured, what is it you're trying to protect, is it data within a database, or is it files specifically outside of that database that have already been mined for data and intelligence built. Are you focused on, again, um, governance, risk and compliance? Is there a big driver to get better at understanding the regulatory frameworks out there, um, understand the impact and likelihood versus impact? Um, do you need to get better at building relationships with your owner? Um, is it classification? Do you need to move forward with classification? Um, I'd always recommend if you're using keywords such as confidential to classify documents, you're always going to end up with millions of false positives if you rely solely on data classification. Um, is there an issue around data sovereignty where, again, you need to protect data within, again, silos and within the country that it's originated from? Because, there's again, there's lots of data protection laws that require you to do that. So understanding your source and destination data flows is really important and questions that need to be asked today. Um, and also go back to the data creators. Who is actually creating the, this data? Understand the life cycle and when that data is no longer required that it's removed and obviously secured destroyed appropriately and also again what is the retention period for that data. Understanding the data movement, the relationship with the third parties you already have, um, working with relationship managers, again all good questions to ask. If you have a relationship manager that's great, you can have a meeting with them straight away, understand the third party interactions you have. And then finally again what is the actions you need to take? So do you need to anonymize specific data? Do you need to encrypt, do you need to encrypt that data? Happy did reading my question. If you see an external or internal threat, do you just hit, hit merely have to report it, or do you have to stop it from happening? These are all really important important questions to ask, <clears throat> even from a day one of your security program. So I have about fifteen minutes left really to cover the, the technology and how WebSense can help. So I know a lot of this was strategy, a lot of this was focused on how you can move forward and build that strategy before you even start looking at technical controls or even coming back down from understanding your current technical controls to further build that strategy. So most of you may, may already know that WebSense offer a DLP technology. I've already showed you a few screenshots highlighting how we can help from a technical perspective. I'm going to go into a bit more detail around how we typically see deployments work and wins that we see from this. So really understanding, again, your, and looking at putting the best, con, the best controls and, again, the best education around that data and data handling is really important, but also then looking at what's happening to your organization today. Are you, le are you leaking data um, today? Do you need to start looking at notifications and, and education? Do you need to start looking at quarantining and blocking that type of data or, or some re-education as well? Data in motion, data in use are very similar. Data in motion is again looking at data leaving. Data in use is looking at anybody managing, in some cases, handling that data, um, typically on an endpoint type, type device, a mobile device. Um, so again, it's important to understand the link between all three of those areas. We see again looking at organisations that are looking to as a, as a quick win, looking at data in data in motion primarily, looking at where they're looking they're leaking data out through typically the web channel. So the most majority of applications are now web based, and in most cases they'll be they'll be they'll be sharing this information, even some infringing on privacy but looking at specific data sets, data exfiltrating for the web channel. You can do this pretty easily, again, with WebSense technology. You can click on things like elevated exposure. They're already considered a threat out there. You can click on that link. You can click on this uh, wizard. It will create a policy. It will look at anything leaving your organization to a, either a compromised website, a command and control a set of infrastructure um, that is continuously updated every, every minute, every hour of the day you can actually see what's happening there through FTP, again through things like network, network email and instant message. All these things are, are possible. There's a response plan. So if we do see an incident that relates to an employee, either misuse or somebody being targeted, we typically communicate back to, to the owner that then takes a response, takes action based on that incident. And again, that can either be either through a predefined action or again a response to that action. There will be a security operations analyst typically involved or an IT analyst involved that can help looking at escalating that incident if it becomes, uh, if it's severe, based on obviously deploying the technology. But they need to work really closely hand in hand with that owner where possible. Um, and again, in most cases, feedback, again, reports, incidents to a compliance manager that can manage this across the rest of the business through department head, 
through HR, through legal, internal audit, and then worst case scenario, to that critical response team that will give you the ability to again, respond to any type of data breach incident. Looking at things like predefined policies, so within, within WebSense DLP, we really focus on again building up from just using key phrases and dictionaries, even moving past things like regular expressions and, and running things like scripts and natural language, natural language processing. Looking at elements of machine learning, so the using the resource of the technology to understand and find data that is sensitive without having to write lots and lots and lots of policies. And then looking at file or database fingerprinting where you know you have sensitive data um, using the technology again as a resource to do that for you. And that's typically those top two sections are the most accurate and require less resources from your organization. And again, focusing on those kind of things, even from the outset, um, you'll always see quick wins as part of that. Looking at very, very basic rules, so looking at this from a rule perspective, setting up a rule, so do not allow HR to send personal records to. And you can actually build this as part of a rule-based policy, very easy to do, um, again, check boxes, um, it's probably about four or five clicks to be able to do this. And again, even if you're just reporting back to the, to the owner of personal information of the organization, monitoring any type of data leaving through email and web that goes to um, a destination that hasn't already been approved. This is always a great response, and again, always a quick win, always find incidents relating to this type of rule. Quick policies, this is something that, we, that we've built into the technology over the last five years, is so that, again, when you can, you can build these things, you can conform to regulatory and compliance laws with a few clicks. And again, even if you wanted to do this from a, a proof of concept perspective, you can do that, and you can really start focusing on it, at least trying to justify the, the spend on this technical control by showing, again, non-compliance with regulatory or compliance laws. So, Shona mentioned right at the beginning, compliance laws and regulatory frameworks are changing. Um, fines are increasing from current Data Protection Act is maximum £500,000 fine for, for gross negligence, going up to now €100 million Euros if, you're, if you're found to be gross negligent around data protection. So, just showing them, again, typically the impact, showing your exec team the typical impact, and just applying this one policy and monitoring even as part of proof of concept, we'll always be able to justify potentially a, a, an additional spend in a DLP type technology. Again, building these things, looking at regions where you operate from, looking at your industry specific, um, then it's focusing on, again, specific data. So is it things like PCI that you need to be um, perhaps more prepared for, looking at data, specific structured data, card data? Or is it, again, company confidential and intellectual property you need to build? These policies are all predefined. They need, you need to literally click on them, apply them to the, again, your, your outbound controls, your web and email gateways, or even just endpoint, and you'll see results from day one. I mentioned right at the beginning around specifically looking at risky employee behavior. And again, this is something that we've built in the last few years, looking involved and, and again, looking at empowering the, employee, the, the owner looking at how you can actually do that as part of, again, a policy, scanning specific data, looking at the accuracy of that data, and then tuning that, again, becomes very, very easy as well. And it's just passive monitoring of events to issuing things like notifications, educating employees real time when they make a mistake or when there's a reduction in those series of events. So this was an organization last year. We tracked the number of events they saw across the year, and when they put in notifications, they saw a significant drop in the events, the number of events generated. And then when they applied active enforcement, they saw, a, again, a bigger drop as part of this as well. Things, again, cloud and, and obviously focusing on mobile was mentioned, and looking at things like endpoint online applications, so anybody using Gmail, anybody using Salesforce, stop to do that, and it violates a, pop, uh, a policy. You'll see a pop-up that advises you the last uh, month or last week. And again, focus really on, again, the integrations where it's perhaps behind the scenes. Anybody that signs up for, a, uh, again, a live account now will automatically get SharePoint. They'll also automatically get all their, their office applications in the cloud um, on their iPad. And again, integrating that with, again, the existing WebSense technology, it, it, it's, it's seamless. There's no additional agent. There's no additional things to add. But you still get the great data protection um, as part of that as well. And again, you still get the incidents monitored alerted, and you can then still use that as part of the education program. So as a summary, I have one minute left. Um, 
definitely start looking at your strategy and trying to map threats to assets to build in and choose the correct countermeasure. And where possible, again, basic risk management, model likelihood and impact of a data breach. Um, produce a threat model, so extend past the common actors. So don't just look at the external and internal threat, look at those specific actors and try to build that into your, into, at least into your security response program. Um, biggest recommendation is build a coalition um, and use Cotter's model for a data security project. So at least highlight the urgency, help the, the, the coalition build that vision across the company. Um, it sounds like I'm talking about organizations that are 50,000 employees. This, this, this works also for very small organizations. You have to raise the human IQ. Um, educating employees, looking at combating insider threats is really important. DLP is the hot technology right now. I think Gartner have rated this as the fastest growing technology now. Um, but also, don't just try DLP. Think about how you can use it for behavioral monitoring and how you can justify that purpose when you make it data centric. And of course, use things like machine learning, file fingerprinting, don't just rely on classification. out there uh, today. So with that, I think I'm finished exactly on time, unfortunately. We still have a few people on the line hoping that if you have any... Okay, it appears that you and Neil's covered the topic so comprehensively that all questions have been driven out of people's minds at present. Um, thank you very much everyone for your time and um, thanks for attending today. Um, I've had one question around um, the link to where the presentation will be available. Um, I will make sure that the presentation will be posted online as well as the actual recording of the webinar. So I will make sure that's emailed to all attendees and those that registered and couldn't make it um, today and um, post events. So it won't just be the actual um, audio and live version of the webinar. We'll also make the presentation fully available to everyone. Um, thank you very much today, Neil, for your time. Thanks everyone for attending and hopefully we look forward to welcoming you to future security updates in the future. Thank you very much everyone. Have a good morning. <laughs>